welcome back. Today, I am going to show you a very easy, relaxed way to approach fruit textures. They can be kind of intimidating when you look at them and you think, oh, that's, that's too hard, I can't do it. But honestly, I will show you very easy approaches so that you can get really good results. And if your goal is to move on to very realistic painting, this is a great stepping stone. When you paint very realistically, then it takes many hours to achieve that look. So this is not quite that intense. It's very simple, basic initial steps that you would take to get to a very realistic item. Now, you don't have to take it all that way. We're not. I don't paint that way. I paint in a much more loose way. And one day I will do a video on painting very loose fruits and vegetables and food items. But I think you'll find that achieving these textures is much easier than you would think. And we're not going over all the textures. These are just some of the more common ones that you would find in fruit. Number one, soft and streaky. With peaches, their skin is very soft and kind of spotty, not really striped, not really spotted, but streaky. I have an easy way to achieve this. Let's just look at our colors here and get an idea. Color makes a big difference. And you can sketch this out if you want, trace it, do whatever you want. I'm just going to start laying down my clean water and just get a basic round shape. The good thing about fruits and vegetables and things like that, they're not perfect in nature. So we don't have to have a perfect circle. So I'll put down some water. Now I'm dropping in that nice golden yellow to give us a nice base layer. And that's also allowing me to see the real shape here and I can kind of fine tune that a bit. And then I'm just going to start dropping in reds and pinks. You can vary this a little bit. And I'm just noticing where the peach is darker. Now I'm going to take what's called a rake brush. That is what is going to give us this streaky look. So I'm dropping in the pinks with this rake brush which is basically just a brush that has had its hair thinned. Now notice I'm just touching the pigment to the peach. I'm really not brushing it on. If you brush it on, it's going to leave more of a stripe type texture. So I'm just touching it, dabbing it here and there, and the water will disperse that pigment out in a softer way. Now my peach is fuzzy, but it's not overly fuzzy. If you would like to add an even more intense fuzziness to your peach, then go check out this video. It's the same technique that I used with this little fluffy chicken. And now that we have the texture the way we want it, I've switched back to the filbert brush to drop in more pigment to make more intense colors especially on this left side. Depending on your paper, you may have a hard time getting a clean edge. If it's a very textured paper, it's not going to give you a nice smooth edge. This paper is a little textured, but you know, I can usually get a, a decent smooth line. And really, it's just about dropping in colors as it's drying. And when it dries, as you know, watercolor tends to get lighter. So it's just a process of sitting here and watching it dry. As long as it's still wet, you can drop in as much color as you want. You just have to be careful about pooling. See, I've got a little... A little spot right here that needs smoothing out and notice right where I am now there's a lot of pooling there. Pooling can cause hard lines sometimes that doesn't matter sometimes you may not want hard lines but I think 
This is probably not going to give me a hard line. It is some pooling, but it's not a lot of pooling. And I really like pooling, especially for things like this, because where that pooling is occurring, it's heavy pigment, so it is going to dry darker. So in this case, that's really going to work for us. So when you do have pooling, just notice where is it happening and is it happening in a spot where it can help you or hurt you. I think this one's going to be fine. Notice how pigment that I dropped in with the rake brush, see how it's not making a spot and it's not making a stripe. It's a little bit of both. And then let's add a few realistic things that will just help convince our viewer of what this item is. So I've noticed that on this peach, there's a little bit of a lighter colored valley right here. And that will really make our eye believe that this is a 3D curved item. So I'm just using a fine liner to pick that pigment up and wipe it off. And since it's still wet, some pigment may seep back into it a little bit, but that's fine. We can just keep removing it until we're happy with it, which I think it's fine the way it is. And I noticed there's a little white spot on the very bottom, so I'm taking off the pigment for that as well. And another thing we can do to add a little realism is to add a shadow. Now I'm using the rake brush just because I happen to have it close at hand, but I have to be honest, I am not a fan of the rake brush for shadowing. It added too much texture. Number two, citrus skin. This is a fun one. As with all our fruits today, we are going to first do a base layer of water because we're doing wet on wet so I've just added a little a little light layer over that water and I'm really more worried with shadows so I want to set those shadows up correctly so we'll have a light side and a dark side and since we did the shadow on the right for the peach we'll do that with all of our fruits today which means that I need to put in some white over here on the left side for reflective light that will really help with the illusion of a shadow side is that the other side has to be lighter makes sense right now i'm going to use a deer foot to make the citrus peel texture this is a magic little brush so it's called the deer foot because of course it's shaped like a hoof you want to use this when it's very dry and then you dab it in I prefer a very thick consistency and then try it on a piece of scrap paper just to make sure you don't have too much on it and then we're just going to dab it around all over the orange and that will make it look like citrus peel it's magic And because it flares out, it's easy to get it off of the orange and onto the back background of your paper. So you want to be careful with that. Sometimes I can, I'll pinch it so that I can have more control over that and keep it within the lines that I want to keep it in. I've gone back to using my Filbert brush for the shadow since the rake brush did not work out so well on the peach for the shadow. My brush of preference for a shadow is just a basic round brush. Number three, fleshy stone fruit. Now for the inside of a peach, I'll need a more subdued yellow than what I have. All my yellows are fairly bright. So I am going to add buff titanium to it to give it a little bit more of a 
pale, more pale or earthy look. For the peach slice, I'm going to concentrate on putting the pigment toward the outside because the peach really, it's very fleshy on the inside and it kind of has these little streaks that go toward the center, toward the pit. So I want that to happen naturally. So I'll just put all the pigment on the outside and the water will start drawing it toward that center. And then I can add a little red or pink here to make that, that staining that comes from the pit. And since it's not, it's wet, but it's not soaking wet, then it will just slowly leach toward the yellow and the yellow slowly leaches towards the pink and it's just perfect that it, it works very well and I'll just keep adding a little pigment on the outside for it to be darker on that cut edge then we can add some peach peel here on the outside we'll give it a little more contrast and we don't need to worry about being smooth because it will look more real if it's a little bit jagged And it bled a little bit into the yellow there, so I'll just pick that up and wipe it off. And when the center is dry, then I will go back with more pigment and little dots, because you know how where the pit has been, sometimes it's, it's a little tougher there and can have some darker spots. Number four, citrus segments. Oh, these are so fun. There are so many different styles to paint these in. It's sometimes hard to decide how I want to paint these, but I'm going to keep with the style that we're working on with all of these fruits today. So that means a little more realistic, but it's still going to be easy. So I've drawn out my little half slice of orange here and divided it up into these little triangle segments, but I'm still going to keep it very loose and easy. If you're painting these in a very realistic way, it really takes a long time and you really have to think about each little line that goes into making these little pulpy citrus triangles. But don't worry, we're not doing that today. We are going to be very casual. So I'm filling each of these little triangles with some pigment, stained water. And the thing that I really want to think about if I were painting these in a real fun and funky way, I might leave a lot of white space between each triangle, but to go along with the style that we have going today, I really don't want to do that. I want to keep that space between each triangle very, very thin. That will go a long way into making this look a little more realistic. So I'm going to coat each one of these in multiple, multiple layers. Probably we might have something like five or six layers before we're finished here. So I'm just scribbling. I'm not thinking much about where I'm keeping my lights free. I'm just scribbling. And I'll keep going back over it and over it and scribble, 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 a little bit darker, a little bit darker. Just need to remember to preserve some lighter layer space. So you don't want to cover up every spot that you've already been over. We, we really need white and very light spaces as well as very dark spaces to give the illusion of moisture and shininess. So we'll talk a, more about juiciness in just a little while. But for this segment, we're just talking about how to get this texture into these little triangles. So basically, all I'm doing is scribbling. You can do that. It's no big deal. It's not hard. You just scribble, 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 and try to allow each color to stand out. Don't cover each color with the next color. That, that can be kind of hard sometimes, especially working in a small space, but that's okay. Just keep that in mind as you're working, and, and you'll do fine. As you see, Mine has dried and there's not quite as much white space inside my circles as I would like, but that's okay. It's not a problem. And I've just put down some clear water, which I want that clear water 
down here on the bottom because I want this orange rind to bleed into that white space just a little bit. I don't want to cover that white space up, but I do want the orange rind to be soft, not a hard line, a soft line there on the inside. And then to get the hard line on the outside, I will paint with this very fine liner and a darker orange on the dry paper. And I'll let it touch the wet part right there, but I'm, draw I'm painting it on dry paper on the outside. So that will, will cause that hard line to have a smoother finish. And then after my my little triangles dried, I decided I needed more dark pigment. So I'm going back and scribbling again over the top with an even darker orange. And if you need to darken up any color, especially like this orange, I needed to darken it up a little more than just the straight pigment. I added just a touch. You can add a touch of red or a touch of brown to it, either one. And that will make it darker. And then don't forget that little white center part there. We have to define that in some way. So I took a little bit of my lighter orange and I'm just barely touching, making some little shadows there. Nothing specific, just kind of scribbling in it to add some shadows so that you can tell that is something there. Number five, bumpy surfaces. So some fruit can be bumpy, although the skin itself is smooth, just like this pear. So how in the world would you paint that? Well, there's a real easy way. Of course, we're doing wet on wet, just like every other one we've done. Fill it with water, a little light pigment. We're going to get our base color down. And I did not sketch this out first. Maybe I should have because <laughs> my pear's a little square, but that's okay. Feel free to laugh at that square pear if you like. Now, in order to make this look bumpy, we need to add shadows, of course. It all always boils down to lights and shadows, right? So I will add a little bit darker pigment here just because we're we are going to have a shadow going to the right like the others. I'll add in a few different colors even, different colors of green. But what's really going to make this look bumpy is that I am dropping in pigment and just drops and I'm leaving lots of areas of little white spots as well. So instead of like on the orange, where we had more smooth color, but it was just lighter on the left side, darker on the right side. This one is going to be lights and darks, kind of blotchy all over, and that will give the illusion of bumps. And I've also added a little brown up there at the top, just because that's what my pair had, is a little brown little brown patch and I probably could have even gone darker with that little brown patch but that doesn't matter that was just kind of a spur of the moment decision to, to add that little brown patch and it doesn't matter so see how that skin looks bumpy because it's splotchy there are lights all over it and there are darks all over it. And then I'll just finish it off with a quick stem. And see how fast that was? Super easy, super fast.
and this particular variety of pear has little freckles so I'll add little freckles to mine as well Number six, whites. Okay, this one is super duper easy. So I am just going to use a watered down mixture of buff titanium and clear water. That's it. That's, well, that's mostly it. So I'll just outline the little slice. I'll let a little more pigment gather at the bottom. And then right up here in the center where the seeds are, I'll add just a little bit of a brown. Any brown will do. I've used Van Dyke brown in with that same mixture just to darken it, just a hint, just to draw out that little area. And then I'll come back with straight Van Dyke brown and draw in a little seed, the little stem portion at the top and the bottom, and then go back with the green that we've used, that green mixture, and outline it for the skin. And that's it. Number seven, multicolored fruits. There are so many, but I love mangoes. And while I was looking in the grocery store, this one caught my eye. It's such a pretty color, very vibrant, lots of, lots of greens in here some orangey, yellow, red, pink, so many colors. So I am going to trace this one. And I mean, I am going to trace the fruit. <laughs> you can use a picture, you can use your actual fruit. I just wanted a rough idea of the shape because if I tried to freehand this shape, I would never get it right. And tracing the actual fruit is not a perfect solution either but I just wanted to be able to to get the basic down and I'm also using a colored pencil because colored pencils will well it's a watercolor colored pencil let me clarify that that is a watercolor pencil and I love using these to draw or trace because it disappears when it gets wet now the downside of this is it doesn't erase well. So if you're using it, go very lightly while you're drawing until you get it exactly where you want it. And we'll put our base layer down. And since this mango is half green and half red, I'll just do the one half that's green. I'm dropping in various different colors, lots of colors of green. And then I'll go back and, and get this other side wet. So the important thing is, of course, we want the whole thing to remain wet while we're working with it. because so we have a lot of color we want to drop in here. And I really want those two to merge on their own for the most part. So I'm being careful not to brush anything toward the center anyway. I'll just drop in some yellow, a little bit of orange too. And I put my, my water down inside my line because I really want a hard line on the outside. And this mango is very smooth, so we'll need that hard line on the outside. So I just went back just a second ago and allowed my brush to go over my water line so that half of it, like I'm doing with the red here, I'm letting part of it hit dry paper and part of it hit wet paper. And that will give a more smoother line. More smoother, more smooth. A more smooth line. And it's pooling quite a bit because I've put a lot on here. so. We can just dab it, wipe it off. A little pooling will be good, just like with the peach. It'll give us a more intense 
area of that pigment, but I know I want to keep adding pigment to it. I'm not really done yet, so I took a little bit of that moisture off. Just trying to define that edge a little more, get some shadow going here. And since there's so much moisture on it, I can pick it up, move it around a little bit so that they'll mix better. Number eight, stripes. Of course, striped fruit means watermelon. So there's mainly greens, a little bit of yellow. There's some imperfection with some little browns from the dirt or whatever but I want to notice how these stripes come together. That's an important thing to note. Let's move this over here. So it, this is round, not perfectly round, but roundish. So I think I'm actually going to sketch it because I don't trust myself to, to get it a nice pleasing shape. Fill in our base layer, and I'm using a larger brush because there's so much area here to cover. And while we are using some specialty brushes to do certain things today, for the most part, if I've not mentioned a specific brush, then you can use whatever brush you feel most comfortable with. But this little brush is nice. It has soft, rounded tips so it works well with circular objects and that wasn't quite as dark as I wanted it so I'm going back with another layer putting a little bit more pigment in there and we're going to add this yellow because I really love that spot there on that watermelon so we'll add some of that And for the brush for the stripes, I'm using a round brush that has a more pointed tip just because I know with these stripes, in order for it to look curved, they need to be thinner on the ends and wider in the middle, right? So the first stripe went down that middle because that's the straightest one. That was the easiest one to do. And now all these others need to curve a little more. And I'm not doing, um, what do you call it? even lines. I'm, I'm really letting it be blotchy because that's what the actual watermelon does. And I'm getting a little pooling here down one little line, a little vertical line there. So I'll just keep picking that up and it's okay. Things like that happen in nature all the time, but I know I, I need to put more pigment down so I don't want it to get out of hand. So the important thing is we really want to pay attention to getting these lines going correctly so that it will look round. And that's why I was noticing how they came together on the real watermelon. So they all come to one point at each end. And it's also kind of spotty. So I'm going to add a few extra spots in here just to make it more look more like my watermelon. And because it's wet, those little spots will get a little blurry, which is perfect. I'm not really thinking about where I'm putting them. I'm just randomly putting them down. 
So that was really fast. I'll clean up the edges there. Number nine, juicy. Well, we've, we've talked about this a little bit before. The way that you make something appear juicy is you have to have lights and darks. And I really should have put clear water down. I don't know why I didn't. I did on every other thing that we've done today. And on the one piece where I'm doing juicy, I neglected to put the water down first. But that's okay. You may want to try it that way though. It would work better. Because mine actually gets a little darker than I want it to. And then, so I set up the basic triangle, the basic watermelon wedge and put a little clear water at the bottom because a lot of times with watermelon pieces, they, you know, the rind and the, the meat portion really can meet up and, and blur into each other and that will just add to the juiciness of it. The fact that that rind has, has merged in with the pink part of the, the watermelon and it was looking rather flat to me. So I decided to add, to make it a, a true wedge so that it didn't look so flat. So I left the edge there white so that it makes it look more like a wedge. And it's drying pretty light. So I am going to go back over it here in just a minute. And just like with the orange, I want the rind to bleed into the white part. So I'm re-wetting that a little bit to get it to bleed a little bit more and get a little more fuzzy. And again, just like the orange, I'm going back with a deeper green on the outside, partly on dry paper, so that there will be a hard line there. This is drying very, very light. So I'm definitely going to go back over And this is also called glazing. If you go back over the top of a painting completely, like I'm doing there, that's glazing. But I want to intensify this, so I am going to drop in even more pigment. And I probably covered up a little bit too much of that bottom layer, but that's okay. I'll just keep going darker, and that will help. Okay, the last one, number 10, seeds. So this will go into the juicy as well. These kind of go hand in hand when you have seeds. Seeds can be different colors, but especially when your seeds are black, they can really dull it down and take away from that juicy, glossy feeling. So there's a little trick. You add a little bit of white to your seeds and that makes them look more wet. And I could have really added white to the actual watermelon as well to add some light to make it look even more juicy. But this is this is good enough. This is I'm happy with this and we'll just add some little watermelon splatters out here. Well, here are all the things that we painted today. That was quite a bit. We covered a lot of ground, but I hope that this will help you see that painting in this way doesn't have to be difficult and it doesn't have to be ultra time consuming. They basically are all the same base, wet on wet technique. There are just little subtle differences between each one that can add to the texture effect. Thanks for hanging with me if you made it all the way to the end. I hope you found some really good tips here that will help you enjoy watercolor painting more. If you like this one, give me a thumbs up and please subscribe if you haven't already for more videos coming up soon. Thanks.